Have you ever been to a frost fair? Well, there's nothing finer on a cold winter's day when the air is so crisp it almost hurts to breathe it in and the ground below your feet crunches and crackles on the thick ice that was once a fast-flowing river beneath your feet. If you listen closely, you can hear the cries of the merchants selling their wares. Hot wine, gingerbread, fruit, cobblers, barbers, even a pub or two. And watch you don't get knocked over as the ice skaters turn and swirl around you. Perhaps you can warm yourself by one of the many fires lit along the river and enjoy the view of the city from the frozen waters. And if you look up, you'll see old London Bridge, the very reason that the frost fair exists at all. These frost fairs have been happening for decades, centuries even. Between 1600 and 1814, it was not uncommon for the River Thames to freeze completely for several weeks, even months at a time. You see, there has been more than one ice age. And during the Little Ice Age, the whole of the Northern Hemisphere was gripped by bitterly cold winters and freezing conditions, cold enough to make rivers freeze solid including Old Father Thames. The reason this river was so susceptible to freezes was London Bridge itself, built upon 19 arches supported by small piers with projecting starlings that would break up the flow of the river. In winter, when these arches get blocked with ice and debris, London Bridge acts like a dam, slowing the Thames and helping it to freeze. The first record of the Thames freezing is during the reign of Gloriana herself, Elizabeth I, who on learning that the River Thames was now a solid sheet of ice, ordered that an archery field be laid out on the ice so that she could practice her target shooting and hair coursing, something at which she excelled. The onset of these unusually harsh winters brought with them death and famine. As the ground froze and could not yield the crops and the people struggled to stay warm. But they also brought opportunity as Londoners sought to make the most of the situation. Ever enterprising and resourceful, they set up the first frost fairs on the ice. Between 1607 and 1814, there were seven major fairs, as well as countless smaller ones. The first recorded frost fair was during the winter of 1607 and 1608. That December, the ice was thick enough and firm enough that people could walk from Suffolk into the city along the frozen river itself. By January, the freeze had set in hard enough that people began setting up camp on it. There were food merchants, market stalls and games. The sight was truly something to behold, with hastily constructed shops, taverns, skating rinks, and even football matches and bowling tournaments. The first frost there was reported by Thomas Decker, a famous Elizabethan pamphleteer, in his work, The Great Frost, Cold Doings in London, except it be at the lottery with news out of the country. A familiar talk between a countryman and a citizen touching this terrible frost and the great lottery and the effects of them. The pamphlet was written as though it were a conversation between two men, one from the country, the other from London. They discuss many things, but mostly how they are coping with how cold it is. The Londoner describes the rather unique experience of being shaved in the middle of the frozen River Thames, an experience to be remembered in the afterlife. The winter of 1683-84 became known as the Great Winter, because lakes, rivers and even the seas of southern Britain froze for up to two miles from the shore. This was such a strange phenomenon that on the 31st of January 1684, even the London Gazette newspaper reported on the fact that the weather had brought to a halt all the commerce on England's waterways. 
The fact that the Thames was at a standstill meant that hundreds of bargemen and sailors were literally frozen out of work. But from this great freeze rose incredible opportunity in the form of the Blanket Fair, perhaps the most famous frost fair of them all. The unemployed bargemen and sailors made opportunities for themselves to earn money by guiding sightseers out onto the ice or turn their boats into sledges by means of runners and giving sleigh rides all along the frozen river, or selling books, toys and trinkets from market stalls. Barbers, fruit peddlers and goldsmiths also set up shops on the ice. Printers even hauled out huge, unwieldy printing presses to produce personalised fair tickets, poems and cards that cashed in on the novelty of publishing from on top of a frozen river. Behold, the River Thames is frozen o'er, which lately ships of mighty burden bore, now different arts and pastimes here you see, but printing claims the superiority. The fair was described in the diary of the writer John Evelyn. Coaches ply from Westminster to the Temple, and from other stevies to and fro, as in the streets, sliding with skeets and bull baiting, horse and coast rachers, puppet plays and tinterludes, cooks, tippling and other lewd places, so did it seem a Blatchian triumph or carnival on the water. Whilst it was a severe judgment on the land, the trees not only splitting as if lightning struck, but men and cattle perishing in diverse places, and the very seas so locked up with ice that no vessels could stir in or come out. And the very sea so locked up with ice that no vessels could stir out or come in. The fairs attracted everyone, from the poorest peasants to royalty. Rumour has it that King Charles attended this fair and partook of a particularly fine spit-roasted ox. A ticket that was folded in his pocket marking the occasion is still in the collection of the Museum of London. A printout of the Frost Fair in 1715-16 shows us the variety of amusements that could be found on the ice. Nine-pin playing, roast ox, a printing booth, a music booth, a tavern, a printing press, a gingerbread store, goldsmiths, even a poet and his wife. This print is typical of those mass-produced before the fair then customised on the ice with the name of the purchaser. But with all the fun of the Frost Fair came grave danger. And it goes without saying that holding a festival on a rather precarious piece of ice inevitably meant that there were accidents and even tragedy. During the fair of 1739, a whole swathe of ice gave way and swallowed up tents and businesses as well as people. And in 1789, some melting ice dragged away a ship which was anchored to a riverside pub in Rotherhay. As the gentleman's magazine wrote at the time, the captain of a vessel lying off Rotherhay, the better to secure the ship's cables, made an agreement with a publican for fastening a cable to his premises. In consequence, a small anchor was carried on shore and deposited in the cellar, while another cable was fastened around a beam in another part of the house. In the night, the ship veered about, and the cables holding fast carried away the beam and levelled the house to the ground, by which accident five persons asleep in their beds were killed. By the 1800s the climate was starting to warm up. The severity of the winters was at last waning, and the last ever London Frost Fair took place in the January of 1814. This fair would have been a welcome break for Londoners, who, weary of war and funding campaigns against Napoleon's army, and hearing of his victories in Europe, flocked to the frozen river, little knowing it was the last time they would do so. Although it only lasted five days, this fair was to be one of the largest on record. Thousands of people attended every day, and there was said to be every possible form of entertainment, including a parading elephant. 
At every glance there was a novelty of some kind or other. Gaming was carried on by all its branches. Many of the internet admirers of the Prophet's games by EO Tables, Rouge Enar, Totem Wheel of Fortune, the Gata were industrious in their avocations. And some of their customers left the lures without a penny to pay the passage over a plank to the shore. Skittles played by several parties and the drinking tents were filled by females and their companions, dancing reels to the sound of fiddles, while others sat round large fires, drinking rum, grog, and other spirits. Tea, coffee, and eatables were provided in abundance, and passengers were invited to eat by way of recording their visit. Several tradesmen, who at other times were deemed respectable, attended with their wares and sold books, toys, and trinkets of almost every description. The fair even had its own main street. The Great Mall, or Walk, was from Blackfriars Bridge to London Bridge. This was named the City Road, and lined on each side with tradesmen of all descriptions, wrote George Davis, a London printer. Of booths there were a great number, which were ornamented with steamers, flags, and signs, in which there was a plentiful store of those favourite luxuries, gin, beer, and gingerbread. His book, entitled Frostiana, or to give it its full title, Frostiana, or A History of the River Thames in a Frozen State, and the Wonderful Effects of Frost, Snow, Ice, and Cold in England, and in different parts of the world, interspersed with various amusing anecdotes, to which is added the art of skating. In the book's introduction, we are informed that as an additional object of curiosity, it may be proper to mention the large impression of the title page of this work was actually printed on the ice of the River Thames. As the 19th century wore on, it became less likely that thick ice would form on the Thames. Besides which, in 1831, the demolition of the medieval London Bridge and its replacement meant the river flowed more freely, and the frost fairs became a thing of the past. Something that we can only imagine, a truly unique and wonderful part of our rich history.